today. Uh, we're Kamiwaza, and I'm just going to jump right into it because uh, I've seen how you guys have been peppering people. I don't know. I want to make sure we get through this. <laughs> All right. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, first, on our mission, and I think this really sets the stage, uh, we're here to actually help the enterprise get to a trillion inferences a day. And that's where we think that's going to be the inflection points for the fifth industrial revolution. Uh, so what does that mean? That means we're actually trying to do this at massive scale, like real scale, like real production scale for the enterprise. Enterprise, the Fortune, 2000, the Fortune 500, Global 2000, and that. These are real world use cases, real world sort of scenarios, and real problems that we're actually trying to address. Uh, with that, and, and sort of to make light, um, we actually, uh, I know the name can seem strange to a, a lot of us here in America. Uh, Kamiwaza, it has a, a nice little history. First off, if you break up the word between um, waza, which is sort of technique, and kami, which is God, you put them together and you put sort of an influence on it, it actually sort of means superhuman. And that's what we're trying to bring to the enterprise is that superhuman capability, superhuman skill. Uh, the other thing is, if you're a dated sort of techie like me, there was a really cool game at the PlayStation 2 uh, called Kamiwaza Theft, uh, uh, sort of the secrets of theft, and I absolutely loved it, uh, and it stuck with me. And then, of course, Seth Godin sort of brought it back in his book, uh, The Icarus Deception. Uh, last but not least, we've actually been at this for uh, quite some time, mentally. Uh, uh, Matt here was the CTO uh, at Faction. I was the CEO and founder. Uh, we're really proud of that. Uh, Faction still continues today. Uh, it's recently been purchased by a private equity group. Um, but we are actually building out at scales. We're talking exabyte scale solutions uh, for multi-cloud data services. We took one copy of data, connected it to multiple clouds. It's a lot of AI, but that was classic AI ML. And what we were seeing is really the gen AI was going to start to you know just eat everything. And we were real excited. We've been thinking about it for a while, and we're happy to get this off the ground. So jumping right into it. This is going to be a real discussion around inferencing. If you're thinking about model training, I love this quote from uh, Menlo Ventures. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. There's only about 50 people in the world, according to them, that can actually increase or make a model better than, say, Claude or ChatGPT4. So if you're just a general enterprise and you're trying to actually train a net new model, you're probably, well, let's just outright say it, you're absolutely in the wrong field. Because if there's only 50 of these people, they're actually working for Google, they're working for Microsoft, they're working for Azure, et cetera. But these enterprises are going to use multiple foundation models. They're going to add retrieval augmented generation, they're going to fine tune it, and they're going to have models for sort of each task or job throughout the enterprise hierarchy. But what you're going to sort of hear from us today and what we're building is really for that inference, for that actual running a model at scale, once again, to get to that trillion inferences a day. Take it away, Matt. Well, I'm going to be honest. We kind of ripped off uh, the Intel slide here. Actually, I really love the story that they had, and I, I felt like it really resonated with the conversations that we've had with people who are practitioners, you know, who are our customers, who are kind of going through this journey, right? This idea that you really do have to begin with the data. And it's all well and good to kind of kick the tires on things. And we saw a lot of people over the past year who were getting into generative AI use cases, and they would do things like, you know, chat with my documents, right? And sometimes they would have small databases and that sort of thing. We then started having conversations with some of the folks we knew from Faction, people who were operating at petabyte scale in terms of data. It turns out then that when you try to apply that same theory to something like, hey, I have a petabyte worth of invoices, you know, that I've collected over 20 years or things like that, you face an entirely different class of problems. There's and by the way, a petabyte of invoices is about 958 million PDFs. I know this. Though the things you figure out. So you also discover along the way that a lot of these stacks that make it so easy to kind of kick the tires right away and get something up, and it does really feel like magic, right? That feeling of superhuman potency, like building an application with Gen AI is one of the things that like drew me to it right away. I could tell there was a real like, game changer. But you know, when you go to the enterprise, you want to have access to the data, you start asking questions like, well, I have tons of data sources. Where do they all live, right? How do I know who's supposed to be accessing them? What do the credentials look like? How is the data stored? Like, is it binary? Is it parquet? And if I'm going to fetch a petabyte of data, how do I even do that and feed it into an inference engine? Because that's astronomical amounts of data. Since we had wrestled with those things in the past, we were really excited about enabling this future where we can apply AI at just truly industrial scale we kind of set out to start tackling that problem. It gets into the model um, side of the equation here. I'm not going to go into all the bullets because everybody can read the slide. But when you get into the model portion of this, you start to realize that, number one, you know, the open source foundational models have come a huge way. And so while there are cases where you can obviously stack 
GPT-4 Turbo, still you know, kind of mm -hmm. the king of the hill versus maybe Gemini Ultra now is doing very well. In terms of its kind of reasoning and its ability to tease things apart, when you get down to these specific enterprise use cases, it's usually complete overkill because you have something that's 98% as good, does a great job on the use case that you can deploy. And one of the things that we found, and this was one of the things that Menlo talked about in their state of generative AI report, is that enterprises still for these production use cases where there's this kind of keys to the kingdom data, they're still kind of reluctant to just push that off into the cloud, right? They're still trying to control their own destiny to a certain extent. And it plays into that same questions around who has access to the data. And so we also set out to have a stack where, you know, if you're a developer and you just throw things at the OpenAI API, say, it's just gonna work for you, right? And outages aside, like you don't have to worry about scale and those sorts of things, right? Once you have a certain number of tokens per minute that you can generate, it's gonna work for you. The enterprise level, you have to ask the questions of like, and this is what people ask us, how many tokens per second can I generate if I use this hardware, if I use that hardware? You know, if I use this model, if I use that model, how many tokens do I need for this use case? And again, you find that there's this like distance between the tire kicking and production. And I know you know, some of the people here who have actual experience building out you know, AI apps, you can kind of see there's this progression where you start off, much like people who do chat GPT interactively, they send it a, a question, it gives me an answer, right? The real enterprise use cases, it's sometimes it's 10, it's 20, it's 50 inferences to answer a question because you're retrieving multiple data sources, you're collating data, you're analyzing you know, whether the question that was even asked is safe to respond or safe to feed to a different model. You're checking to make sure that the output that you're giving is safe to return, right? There's not something weird coming out of the model that it didn't return nothing or a blank string or things of that nature. And so all those things add up to a lot more inference than people expect, and it becomes very expensive very quickly as well. So you have those various challenges of privacy, cost, et cetera, and that desire to control their destiny, right? To build that expertise, which kind of leads into the deployment piece, because we really haven't even talked about what this looks like when you actually go to put things out there. So you, you can go to your you know, vendor of choice and you can buy a bunch of equipment. It can be CPUs, it can be GPUs. Put that in your data center, right? Once you solve for a cooling, you need to worry about that. You turn this stuff up, but then how do you make this happen at scale, right? Like what is the pattern of architecture for saying, I'm gonna you know, handle 100,000 inference calls a second because I have 10,000 developers, 6,000 people in marketing globally, you know, hundreds of data sources, so we think the pattern is with all these agents and activity and stuff, and we really want to just empower the organization globally to do that. What do we do? Well, again, it's problems that are solved for you by the, you know, the clouds, the services. But if you want to do that on your own horsepower, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck between, I can make it work as a one-off, and then how do you get to true production scale, what's scalable, distributed, et cetera. And so a lot of what we're doing is solving those problems, basically around you know, data, model management, operational consistency, deployment at scale. So. so to summarize, my verbose friend here, <laughs> we've delivered a full stack Gen AI. So everything you saw on the last slide was sort of the features and functions that were required to actually deliver on-prem. But the full stack Gen AI, the, the 25 sort of open source packages that come together in the Kamiwaza stack, wasn't enough to actually solve the core problems of scale of an enterprise. It was only enough to solve the core problems of launching private AI for an enterprise. So then we set off to actually build two important feature sets. First is the inference mesh, and second is the distributed data engine. When you combine those two features, and I'll explain them in a minute, you truly can deploy AI anywhere, and I mean on-prem, cloud, core, edge, everywhere. And that mix of sort of where you deploy it, the actual function that it needs to be deployed, means that it will work on an Intel processor, it will work on large GPUs, it will work on specialized ASICs, et cetera. And we're seeing the plethora of that go across the board. So to spin back to it, the inference mesh and distributed data engine work together. This is our paint by number slide. It is in no way, shape or form the actual sort of way the technology works. What you'll see from here is if a user makes an inference request, that inference request then will typically route to where the connection was. Say over the internet, it's gonna to go to the cloud service. The cloud running our stack has the data also in the cloud. That's where it actually runs the embedding, the full RAG process, so that that stack and the models running on that stack can access the data in the cloud. But in this particular use case, the actual data that was referenced in the uh, call from the end user is actually on prep. So even though the inference call went into the cloud, it now directs it via the API to the on-prem. 
because that's where the actual data was that was required for this particular inference. That rag process is ran, the data is collated there, and only the inference request is actually sent back to the cloud, not the actual data. This hybrid approach allows massive scale, petabyte and exabyte level scale for data processing to be actually put into and ran with LLMs so that you can API enable the apps. And I'm sorry, so, is there a question? Yeah, so does that mean your services run as a SaaS? Not as a SaaS, this is a installable package that literally, I believe it's literally a kickstart out of Docker? Uh, it's a kickstarts components in Docker and there's an installable component basically, but you install it either by deploying a cloud image or by installing it on a system that you have on-prem. Okay. So, so what it, but is that the cost perspective of that? So this is basically a controller. So what type of resources <gasps> are needed for uh, Kamawaza that installable from a size, uh, instance size? Well, keep in mind that we're not just dealing with the control plane piece. I mean, we are actually marshalling things. We're standing up APIs that do inference, deploying your models right. So we're going to manage all of the hardware that's in the pool that you're using for all these resources. The actual deployable, though, is pretty modest. I mean, um, you know, we have a community edition. It runs on a laptop. Um, I'm not using it for the demo today, but I have one that I run locally all the time. And um, it's pretty modest. I mean, I'd say depending on how heavy your usage is, like an individual user, it's probably less than a single core, like a constant usage. It's a handful of containers, right? But they're only using like very thin time slices. So like on a MacBook, it probably consumes at most 20 or 30%, you know, um, in the background if it's not really like doing a lot of work. So pretty lightweight. But Me memory wise, same thing, pretty lightweight. But obviously this comes down to a question of like, we're providing components like cataloging, and so if you ingest you know, billions of documents into a catalog or billions of data sources, it's going to use a little bit more memory. Than, but obviously, that's the price you pay when you need to have billions of items in your catalog. So, so you install it cloud on prem wherever you want to install the product? Actually, I hope you install it everywhere. Oh, cloud and everywhere. Cloud. Everywhere you need it, it's installed. <laughs> um, but does it reach back? Where is the, the inferencing and the work actually done then? Is that done in a cloud? Thank you for asking. I mean, the amazing thing is we're really talking about Everywhere you go, you can stand up and deploy us on infrastructure. And we view those basically as groups of servers that are part of the same cluster. So we apply a placement group methodology to say these systems over here, we actually, I mean, the idea of a location, like in the cloud, whatever, is actually a first class citizen. So we know this is my US to East deployment. This is my on-prem in Atlanta deployment, whatever those things look like. That way, and when we do things like ingestion, from the perspective of cataloging, you know, we're going to ingest data in a way where we associate with those locations. So if you ask a question and the question needs data that's in Atlanta, you're not there, but we know that there is inference capacity there and the data lives there, we transfer the request there, do the work, send you back the response, but you don't have to move all that data across the wire. So this is the data has gravity approach. Absolutely. Move the compute closest closest to move the compute closest to the data. Now I just have to worry about, well, no, not worry about it. I can right size it. So let's say that uh, my edge locations, you know, uh, it's too expensive to move the data back mm -hmm. to too expensive, too slow to move the data back to the core or to the cloud. So I can put just enough compute there, whether it's CPUs, GPUs, et cetera and Kamawaza will orchestrate the moving of the inference to that location. Right. Do it, return the results, and... And the results are literally bits. Yeah. You're talking tokens. That's the RAG process, right? Retrieval, augmented generation. First, you retrieve the things that have context, you feed them as part of your prompt, the language model, and then you kind of get an answer back. And we're kind of uh, pairing those things together from a data gravity perspective, which isn't something you worry about when you're asking a tiny question that's a PDF. But when you have a petabyte of data, you absolutely need to, to be aware of that. And keep in mind, data is being generated at the edge, and moving that data has always been the problem. Now you can inference it, run it there, but still get the request back to the core or the cloud where your apps and services are also, and vice versa. We're seeing, I and mean, it looks, uh, the, Fortune, you know, the Fortune 500, Global 2000, they still have the gravity typically in a core data center, whether it's a colo or on-prem, so with cloud services in a hybrid. A practical scale problem uh, life sciences. I'm a bio farmer. I'm collecting genomics data out at the edge. 
And I have scientists located in Germany, and they want to inference off of the data that's in uh, New Jersey, Chicago. Uh, we'll leave some of the European nations out because of. Uh, well, no, we well, can actually, say this. Here's the beauty of it. Yeah, we can You're say this. You're not passing GDPR. We're not passing GDPR. You're passing we're tokens. Well, we're yes. passing tokens. So instead of bringing that data to a centralized location to be processed and inference, that data scientist can do his inference request work remotely without uh, having to have to worry about latency associated with moving the data to the compute. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I, I mean, not just latency. If your edge only has a gig, mm -hmm. you're talking, or megs, you're talking time. To keep these GPUs, your most expensive asset, et cetera, at a core, just an H100 that we've talked about, et cetera, that's not good because if you're taking forever to move that data up there, those cores are not being active. Where at the edge, you can actually have CPU, you can have right size technical compute local to the data to keep those systems active for that inference call. Yeah, and that's a great example. We've actually had literally the conversation with Germany as exactly the example, right, of a place where that in situ inference in the country makes a lot of sense. But there are other use cases too. Like we had a conversation um, just this week with a mining company. And you think about all of their deployment, right, being stretched out in many different places, right, where you actually have you know physical work sites with limited connectivity, and they want to use something like vision models to ensure safety, right? So what happens if the network connectivity goes down, right? And yet there are reasons why, because the hardware you can have on 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 prem when it's this remote location it can be somewhat limited. And so we actually provide that ability then to kind of mar have an understanding where these things live and marshal you know, smaller inferences that need to be done in real time to the local equipment, but then ship things that are more batched or they need to do higher verification with models that wouldn't run on edge devices um, up into those other more centralized sites. So uh, architecture wise, so obviously there's a design that we talk to a common API in the cloud, ideally. API yeah. runs all off our stack, yep. Yeah, and then it's aware of one or more remote sites. Each site indexes itself in terms of its vector database embeddings go into a local rag. Uh, is there a copy of those embeddings sent back to the cloud control no. plane? Nope, uh, and the controller's effectively federated. But think about it, embeddings are pretty big. So if you took a, a high level embedding of a petabyte of data, you're probably looking at terabytes and terabytes of actual data that you would actually put into there. Now granted, there are lighter ones, but there are higher resolution ones, et cetera. So that actually stays local. You, you, you get to really choose this too, by the way. Like that affinity, that's what we do kind of by default. Like the assumption is if you have multiple locations, then you're gonna to wanna to have data in the location, run inference on the location, et cetera. But you are totally able, you know, within the stack to go and query any vector database anywhere and send any inference endpoint and retrieve data from anywhere if that's what you intentionally want to do, the default is to make it the architecturally correct choice. It, it, in fact, that. I believe our, our stack sort of for, for buzzwords, we actually call it opinionated. So it's a full opinionated stack, works out of the box, but it's loosely coupled. And in your case, in your question right there, we actually have connectors for Pinecone. So if you want this all to run in a SaaS service for the vector database perspective, our stack will actually connect to that and you could have a centralized one. But that sort of starts to get into really hybrid architectures because now you have a SaaS service running a centralized uh, vector database with all of ours. But it totally does interrupt as you scale. Yeah, we do a lot under the hood. So we, I mean, we are managing infrastructure. We're dealing with this concept of locality, but we're actually providing a lot of pieces of middleware that wrap around things like sentence transformers to do embeddings around vector databases to kind of provide a little bit of an abstraction layer for people in a way that we can kind of couple it to enable these workflows, right? And so like one of the things that I do in some of the demos is to say, go to this data source, retrieve all the data out of this data set, however many items are in the catalog, right? And it, it manifests as a, a data set that's lazy loaded and you can feed it into a pipeline. And I say for all these things generated embedding, for all the embeddings that come out of the embedding pipeline, put them in the vector database, and now we can start running queries, right? And it doesn't really matter how big it is, right? A gigabyte, a terabyte, a hundred terabytes, just a matter of, how long it takes to, pro how much resources you have and you want to give it to process that pipeline because it can actually spread out and run parallel. The, the chart <laughs> seems to imply you're doing inferencing at both the cloud and the data center and somehow combining the results. That's true. Now, keep in mind, this is not the same inference request, right? But if you think about, you're, if you're probably familiar with the concept of a chain, right? The idea that, you know, for a user request, you, know, you might say, um, 
might first have somebody gets a guardrail that says, is this a safe request to even pass to a model, right? Then the second inference might be to an agent. And you say, the user has requested this. What sort of resources or things will I have to retrieve to answer this question? Then you're going to actually go potentially look those up. Like your agent might actually consult a catalog. It itself constructs requests that go then federate out. Each of those becomes an inference request that says, I have all this data. Is this data pertinent to the request? Because you don't necessarily know. A vector database gives you kind of a rough cut of, is this pertinent? But it might not be the right answer. So you feed each of those into different inference requests. But if you think about somebody who might ask a question like, um, what of all the interactions we've had with our customer, customer X, you know, bought John Smith over the past 90 days been? Well, those might live in on-prem. There might be an SAP instance they're running, a CS gear. Salesforce, they might service be now. stuff in the cloud, et cetera. And you don't really want to go and necessarily retrieve all those and pull them out, especially if you're doing this inference on-prem because you're a little nervous about some of those data sets going into, say, OpenAI. You, want, you don't want to egress data in general because right? it's kind of still expensive to pull data out of the cloud. And so this is a way of kind of taking each segment of that operation having that inference run where the data lives, and then you just get the answer back. Because most of these things digest a lot of data to give you a much smaller answer. But if you take the top 10 results from a vector database search, the answer you want is probably buried in a fraction of one of those 10. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, I'm interested, I, I understand federation from a training perspective across multiple uh, units and nodes and stuff like that. I've never seen um, it discussed from an inferencing perspective. Yeah, I think people are not really thinking about the locality of data. They're not thinking about how they consume infrastructure. And honestly, um, there's so much potential here, but the reality is most of the enterprises we're talking to, there's still a little so, bit of- So in your case, when you're doing. federating these inferences, you're effectively combining the inferences from multiple data sets or multiple data entities and, and, and spitting that all out as, as part of the final uh, result? Is that how I understand? Or the end user is, right? So what we're doing is we're having a common stack that can be deployed on the infrastructure in all these places to catalog all the data, data sources so that when they go to do that, they can write code at the application level that talks to those things that then can automatically consume it wherever it is. They don't have to worry about the locality. Our retrieval will know where it is. It'll go get it. It'll send it to the right endpoint with a common API and then they get those things back, and most of that's under the hood for a typical workflow. And it's not spitting all the data back to the end user, it's spitting back the result. So it's taking all that data, putting it into its knowledge base, and that's what's inference to actually return it. So and that's how you get rid of hallucinations and everything else. If I hear you correctly, you're creating a alternative to data warehousing in which you know I would typically run some type of ETL to bring all of that stuff into a data warehouse, and then I can inference off of the data warehouse that has overhead and expenses. You know, that's a legit model to take, but I still have to worry about governance, et cetera. The ideal is, again, to distribute the compute, get the compute closer to the data. So I don't have the, I don't have some of the advantages or disadvantages or the attributes of a data warehouse, but I can get the end result, which is, give me the correlated data associated to my request. I have, as a end user, I have to build that layer, but this provides the mechanism to build that layer. But you're also going to be able to connect to all your data warehouses as well. I can connect. Including Snowflake. That's just another data, data, data source. Et cetera. So I don't have to make a data warehouse of data warehouses. Uh, 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 and then start thinking of raw data, think of PDFs, think of unstructured data, all that stuff that you weren't putting there in some sort of structured format. Now you, all of this is now access, and that's the point of really where Gen AI is going to go in the long term. You remember really, you started hearing people talk about the virtual data lake, because the data lake concept was like, let's get everything we've got, all our data, get it one place. It'd be much easier to manage and query, right? But it didn't work out, because it's hard to get everything together, because data gravity causes havoc with that. But then, you know, there's this idea of a virtual data lake. Like, how do we understand from a catalog perspective, where does this live and how do we access it, right? Collecting more and more metadata, so a data scientist or you know data analyst who's doing that work can go get data from here and there and so combine it. And you see tools like um, like Starburst, for example, right, doing distributed querying to help with the same thing. I think there's even a pretty good analogy between what Starburst does for SQL queries against unstructured data and what we're doing for inference, basically on you know RAG based data and um, you know the inference endpoints. Great questions. So it sounds like you guys do a lot of consulting with your customers on getting the data ready to be, so they think about 
not necessarily getting the data ready, but to think about how to how to and if they should actually <laughs> expose data from different localities to these it queries. It depends on the maturity for sure. But I mean, and we have you know customers that have incredibly sophisticated infrastructure, like although we actually include a catalog with the tool so that you can immediately start using it because we're actually really kind of passionate about a great developer experience as well. Like if this is early days and empowering the people that actually need to go build these apps makes a, a really big difference. Um, but when it comes to some of the larger businesses, they might have something that's a very complete catalog, right? They're using something, a Hive Metastore if it's older, Alation, AWS Glue, like you name it, there's all kinds of, you know, Azure Purview, just you name it, there's all kinds of choices that you have for these things. We find these catalogs. And we have or are building adapters for a wide variety of these so that we don't, you don't necessarily have to add that data to our catalog if you already have a catalog. We'll consume that metadata in order to go do these same retrieval operations for you. Matt mentioned maturity, you did as well. I did actually just tease up our next slide so well here. So uh, back to this Menlo paper that we love so much. I mean, most companies are still in this sort of closed source model POC. They've literally, their idea of RAG is literally where they upload a PDF and they chat with it type scenario. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a joke, but once you start thinking about what does it take at application level, what does it take to actually scan, as I mentioned earlier, you know, 900 plus million sort of PDFs to get a result set that you want to actually go at. It's a totally different shift. And we see sort of people starting to think about that in that next phase, all right, I have data, it's on-prem, it's not in the cloud, but my processing was in the cloud, so now what do I need to do? Then you start to get around sort of that third stage, and that's really where it starts to make sense to actually privatize all this. That's where we're starting to get called, that's where sort of the pain points that we're talking about and addressing come into fold. And at that point, it's a cost game, it's a data locality game, it's a complexity game because hiring AI engineers, et cetera, is very hard. So our ability to deploy that stack, get them working instantly in the phase three, and then help them when it comes to phase four. And this is the fine tuning phase where they're actually building unique agents at different levels of their enterprise to have outputs and outcomes. Now it definitely, definitely needs to be on the private level because now you're actually putting the context, you're putting sort of the golden keys, everything into these to actually get those outputs. You need to have control of them and you need to go from there. And that's really sort of where we're trying to play in that sweet spot. But to be honest, this is still a two to three year journey for any of the large organizations. And it's probably actually even a longer journey for the smaller organizations because they don't have the resources to get the talent pool to actually make this sort of work. And that's also where we're coming in. You mentioned consultancy. It takes a lot starting from the C-level down to give them a first sort of win and then help them actually build out because this is not your AIML mo model from 2000 and you know, just last year, really. This is a new paradigm, it's a new scaling methodology. And, and what's your favorite quote about two times a day or two times a week at this point? Oh, yeah, I, mean, I used to say that uh, AI was the Christmas that came every two weeks, but it's really like now it's the, the Christmas that comes twice a day. And it, it's good because I've never seen anything like this in my life. Like the pace of innovation is just frantic and it's, it's awesome. You, I, I have a hard time sleeping. I wake up at five in the morning and I just get excited about this stuff. On the other hand, like if you're an enterprise and you want some level of stability and you're thinking about blue-green deployments and you're thinking about, you know, kind of creating best practices in the enterprise, you know, the fact that things change so quickly can be really challenging for you. <laughs> Paul, oh, go ahead, sorry. Having implemented RAG a, a few times, I know how difficult it can be all the way from the type of embedding model that you use to the chunking strategies and how you might even have to implement multi-hop RAG architectures. It seems here from the diagram that you're giving the customer sort of a turnkey RAG system. Does that sound accurate? Completely. Okay. I, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna object a little. I, I, I would say it's a complete from a canvas perspective, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that having things, that, this is where the loosely couple comes in, right? If you have things that are too opinionated that stick together, right? Where you go, I'm gonna press this button that's just gonna give me all the right answers. Mm -hmm. Those things are very fragile, they become brittle. So you could think of it as like, there are a bunch of steps that are important in RAG. Like I have to understand where I can find the data. I have to be able to go and look up some index of it. Like it might be, you know, dense embeddings, it might be BM25, you know, indexes, whatever it is. You need to be able to go then retrieve that, like pull it somewhere where you can break it up into chunks potentially and then feed pieces of it into your large language model. You have to then, you know, have some kind of strategy. Your point about chunking, right? I mean, this is one place where I think our middleware made a big improvement. We saw people doing like, let's just split everything on a thousand characters, and we actually 
change the stack so like our middleware will pre-tokenize the strings for the embedder and split on the length of the model so you get the most kind of density with those dense embeddings and we know per model right how many input tokens it can take how many dimensions come out mm -hmm. and kind of optimize for that so maybe a couple questions around that uh, obviously you're our friend like large scale i heard you mention petabyte um is there an option for the customer to have certain types of models or certain types of embeddings? You know, having played with lots of different embedding models, uh, I, I, I tend to favor open AIs now. I tried Coheres, I've tried even Titan embeddings. Yep. Uh, still keep coming back to open AI. And that I'd imagine too, you know, they just released the newer open AI one and yeah. now you're in a re-indexing game. And that's a big issue at scale. Yeah. So we actually, <laughs> one of the things that we do, and, and we're taking a kind of page out of like classic software development CI CD pipelines, mm -hmm. is we act as a bit of a, we have a model repository and we're not trying to be like another version of Hugging Face because Hugging Face is great at what they do. But if you're an enterprise, you don't go and just retrieve, you know, packages from Maven repository when you go and do Java builds, right? You, you have an artifactory or something else that kind of deals with that stability. Right. Our component for models does that. So you can go to our system and go and, you know, search for models. We're going to go straight to Hugging Face and show you the results. You can download them. At that point, once we have them in the Kamiwaza cluster, we're going to move those bits east-west and keep a sort of like gold master of what you've downloaded. And then we do versioning and like model heritage. So if files start to change or, you know, get to that next stage in that maturity journey, you start doing a fine tuning where you go, hey, this is your fine tune of this model. And you can actually see what it inherited from. But even the metadata has the actual embedding model used at that particular point. Right. I mean, that's a, another relationship thing there too, right? I'm sure if you've changed models a bunch of times, you realize, of course, you generate an embedding with model A, you can't go and generate a query later with model B. Even if you gave up on using model A, you got to go and back to model A. And at scale, think about how big that is. Query embedding. Yeah. yeah. Right. To the end users, they're not used to this because they just type English, right? But under the hood, it doesn't work that way. I'm really glad that you, you mentioned earlier uh, AWS Glue, I think. So, yeah. um, it's one of our 40 connectors. Yeah. Oh, great. You have 40. That's awesome. So when you say loosely coupled, you're saying sort of to the effect that any step in the process can be replaced from a Kamawaza solution to you know a vector database or another. I mean, we have a vector database, but we're middleware and we can help connect to other vector databases if you don't want to use the open source package. So, I mean, you know, is this Airflow, MLflow, uh, how is this, where does the solution fit? I mean, it's yeah. not... I like Airflow and I feel like Airflow has a great place to live in terms of like orchestration. I, I think of them as orchestration for more classic machine learning jobs. And, and I think this is a really weird disconnect. I think this is one of the reasons we came into existence. It's because there are a set of people who just knew nothing about generative AI because they didn't do AI in general, right? There are shops that had like mature AI and ML practices, right? But they were really oriented around training models. Like everybody was turned around data engineers to, you know, collect, clean, organize, et cetera, the data. Data scientists like design, you know, build feature repositories, build models, you know, constantly tune hyperparameters, all these sorts of things that were part of that data science world. Generative AI, I think, flips that completely on its head because what we think and what we're seeing in practice, and, and this is what Menlo agreed in their report, almost the entire workload is inference. And so we're thinking about this as much more how do we orchestrate the consumption? And we're not doing, we're not doing anything right now. And we will eventually help more with things like fine tuning, but we're actually completely starting from the end user perspective, not you know, going in there where, where you see people like Airflow or Weights and Biases or even Mosaic, you know, trying to help people train models. We're much more, more about the consumption and operation piece. Make sense? Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't see much in the visualization, uh, trying to understand where the model's drifting and things like that. Do you have those sorts of solutions as well in there? So, um, we're, yes. Um, I, what I would say is we have lots of metadata right now. And a little bit of this is like customer conversation, right? Because we're still complete, you know, very few people have taken these things at very large scale to production. What we did is we implemented um, some statistics that basically tie together. And I'm actually really proud of like this from an insight perspective, right? Because generative AI is a very strange thing. And this is very different from the version that you see with ML models, right? With an ML model, it was very easy to go out and have like a training set and a validation set. Right, and know that inference was stable, but this is the wild west, right? And you never really know what you're gonna get. The data that you process with RAG is always changing under the hood. What a user prompts with a query is always different. 
the models themselves are improving. So because you're downloading foundational models, you might want to swap. And so you have to ask a question of, we've actually seen cases where either the change in the model or a change in the prompt or even change in an underlying library sometimes or a selection of a different quantization of a model, those things all can cause different results kind of on the boundaries of those queries. And so we're actually stitching the metadata for those things together um, so that you can kind of get a view of how things are performing, not just for a model, but for a prompt against a model of a specific version, that kind of thing, in an app. And that's our artifactory level. And that's what enables blue-green deployments at scale. And I wanted to follow up on your use of the term metadata. Are you talking about metadata about the data sources, the files, yes. the version or what? Where is it? What is the endpoint? What's the user? Yeah, and not connection? metadata about the data that's inside right. of them. No, yeah, we, we are yeah. not doing anything to kind of in, inspect the data. Yeah. Well, I, with, with one exception, I mean, we, you know, part of our tool set does allow you to retrieve things in certain formats. In fact, literally in my demo, I say, go get these Parquet data sets and I show the schema, yeah. right? Yeah. So that kind of metadata, yes. But in terms of like, if you were to ask a question like, I have customers and their spend is X dollars, what's the distribution on, you know, like uh, quintiles of spend? We don't do anything like that, where we're yeah. looking at the content of the data. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, just a couple other things we're seeing at scale or just at the enterprise that's actually not being addressed by like RAG right out of the gate. If you have an end user that hits an LLM model, that LLM model is actually now retrieving data. Did they actually have authorization and access to that data? When you're an enterprise, you have to actually have all those layers built into it. So we have OAuth and SAML into the actual step and phase ahead of that so we can recognize that, that user actually have access to the data that they're requesting from an LLM from a RAG process and everything else. Is that going to be globally or is that maybe at the at each entry level uh, with entry. some sort of pre-filtering? The authentication Separate piece levels. would be globally, like we don't expect to have location-specific identity integrations, but you get to tag data with its location. You also get to associate things like a data source with a, um, like a, a, a group from a directory, right? Like an active directory type group. and so. Um, you can apply both of those in order to kind of, I think, achieve the effect you're asking about. Cool, thanks. I, I can't express enough to one of the core principles of what we're doing here, as you can go ahead and start flipping, is the uh, hardware agnostic piece. We truly believe, once again, the users, the developers, they're going to be running this off of a laptop or a cloud instance, as Matt's going to show. At the edge, because of sort of heat dissipation, et cetera, we're seeing CPU as the core use case out there. Um, actually, I think Matt's going to turn on, is it a fifth generation Xeon? This is, yeah, I'm not trying, I mean, it's on, but yep. <laughs> it is. We have a great cloud instance running in Azure that Matt's going to show you, and it shows the power of even what a CPU can actually do. And then once again, at large scale, where maybe you're making an app level request of thousands and 10,000s users, that's where you would consolidate that back to the core and actually have you know, larger GPU clusters. Uh, in our case, it's all built Ray underneath, allows us to do auto scaling. And if you, your eyes perked up, that's the exact same technology that's in OpenAI, et cetera, on the back end. So we know it can actually do it at significant scale and capabilities. And I think Matt has the demo up. So um, I'm not sure if this is the right place to ask, what's the pricing model for something like this? I didn't step away too quick. Okay, <laughs> um, roughly we're looking at about $10,000 per GPU per year for the on-prem. And it's about $1.30 per hour up in the cloud. It's a significant discount over um, NVIDIA's equivalent stack. But keep in mind, NVIDIA's equivalent stack is missing about 10 pieces of what our stack is. And also, you don't have the open ecosystem and the open hardware support that we have. And, and when kind of acquired in like an enterprise license fashion, that's when fully utilized. So like we're kind of adamantly against shelfware. And we also recognize this is like early days. So you can kind of enter at an entry level, and that's sort of the buyout, you know, all you can eat kind of pricing, but we're actually starting at a lower number when you have hardware that you don't expect to fully ramp, right, where we can actually do it on um, usage metrics. So in the case of on-prem, it's on hardware basis, how many hardware chunks you have, GPUs GPU you mentioned, yep. and, and uh, in the case of the clouds, on a per hour basis. Mm -hmm. Which is really based on the instance and kind of what sort of resources it has. Yeah. Um, so a little bit of an abbreviated tour here, right? Um, and you know, obviously, I feel like we got the this is it's early days, and and uh, I think we got some ways to go on graphic design, right? 
But this is the kind of thing like where you see things like model management going on. So like, you know, one of my favorite. And this is doing a live query right out the hugging face. Yeah, so like, if you type it in, it's going to show you all models that match that syntax capability. And it's very important. Once again, we're going to pull that down. So now you have, it's going to go north, south, and then it can go east, west across the any state. I'm, I'm not actually going to pull down because I have yeah. no idea what the bandwidth is like. But, you know, you get this idea. And for people who've done a lot of this work, like, you know, you know certain type of file formats like GGuff you end up with like 10 different versions of the weights. You rarely want them, which is why we let you kind of select the things that you want to download. Um, we actually pre-downloaded our uh, PHI2 model. So if you guys are not familiar with, there's a really great uh, paper called Textbooks Are All You Need. It was a foundation for PHI1. And these are models that Microsoft built, kind of in a way, I, almost showing off, I think, what you could do with very small models, because only 2 billion parameters, um, if you gave them very, very high quality training data. Um, and we actually pulled that down so we could show you some inference running. Um, and if you actually look at this here, right, you can see, um, you know, over here we've got configs for the models. We've got information about the files. You know, we under the hood, we're not showing that we store things like checksums. Like if you, for example, go to redownload files, like we can let you know um, if checksums match or don't match. And you can see we've got like a deployment of this that's kind of ready to go for the demo. Here we have no catalogs, like we have no data in this. This is like mostly a fresh instance, right? Um, you know, this is running in like single node mode. What's well, running as a single node in clustered mode, I should say. Um, this actually can run right on a laptop though, right? So we've got a community edition right now that some of our early testers are like really, you know, putting through its paces and starting to use, um, you know, on, on local systems. And part of that is because we really want to have something where, you, you know, as somebody who's written a lot of code, I really appreciate the experience you get from something like a Docker, right, where you can have something that runs locally and you can get a certain experience, and then you can have that same experience when you take it out to run it in something like production. And we think it's something that's a little woefully missing right now because everybody can kick the tires, but unless you're using a SaaS service, right, all SaaS services really, your experience is going to change a lot as you switch over, right? And then we can see just kind of some details about the clusters, and it's like default cluster, default location. But this is where you can start inputting these metadata. There's the default vector database that we deploy, right? And a little bit of like metadata about where it lives. Now, I'll show off too that like everything here that's going on on the front end is all API based. Like first class citizen here, you click the button, you can see there's all these docs, you know. Um, In fact, API. that user interface is really just to prove out all the APIs actually work because that's about 90% of the actual development yeah. work is done in the API. Now, I'll add too that like everything in the front end, I mean, 100% of this is all going through the API layer. There is a lot more functionality right now that's under the hood that, that has neither a user interface component nor a REST component. You're going to see some of those interactions in our notebooks. So like speaking of which, I'm going to move my, like I need to move my zoom window around to click easier. When you click on notebooks, like you, you get bounced to the uh, the um, notebook server. So, one of the things that we've been building, you know, as we're kind of getting further along on this journey, right, is a bunch of things like help people understand how to how to use a tool. Like this one here, I think is just literally generating like random data. But like, as a good example, maybe here of some things going on, and actually, um, it goes to kind of show some of the potency of things. If you, if you understand the code layer, and I'll try to walk through it a little bit, you can understand what's going on here. But we're actually um, taking this, and this is just sort of like setting up a few things, but you'll notice that we don't declare a secret key or an access key here. But when we come down here, we're retrieving the meta credentials. Like think of me as the administrator for a data source, right? And I am actually going to ingest this into the catalog. And so I do that, but then, when I actually run the ingestion, right, and it goes out and it goes to my S3 bucket, or in this case, Cloudflare bucket, but it's S3 compatible, and I pull in my parquet files, right, I'm actually, it's taking my credential, it's associating them with that element in the catalog in a way where if I give somebody access to go retrieve that in the future, they're going to be able to go and get it, right, and this is where the intersection with, you know, identity and corporate directories matters, but they're not going to have to know that. But not only that, we're not actually associating the credential directly with the item. We're creating credentials on a credential store and associating that metadata-wise with the item. So if you want to do a credential swap, you can do it en masse. You don't have to do it on every item. And I think if we come back over here now, well, we can actually list these right here in the code. And we see, quickly gives us a list. And if we come back here, the catalog, we can see, oh, hey, these items, we ingest them from the catalog. And we can see, oh, they lived, you know, up on S3 and, you know, there's 
some details about this. Now you actually don't need to know any of these details because you can literally just query this data with our APIs like right in the code and just immediately use it. So, so how many ingestion engines do you have? Because obviously something like a, I don't know, like a lane chain, there's lots of community built ingestion yeah. engines. What about um, today? Yeah, you know, we took a different approach to, and, and by the way, I actually, in one of my examples, it might even be this one, I'm not gonna run it. Um, I kind of had it pre-imported, but you'll notice we actually declared a code splitter here using lane chain tech splitter. A lot of people ask me, like, are you competing with lane chain? Absolutely not. Um, and, and it's kind of amazing to see like the community behind that. I think at some point we'd love to drive some more of that um, ourselves. Um, what we did is we built on top of a couple things, right? Um, the first is our catalog layer is based on a project that came out of LinkedIn, has a massive amount of connectors. We're also leveraging for all the retrieval. We just found Ray has incredible utility for all these use cases, right? As Luke mentioned, it's under the hood for things like inference. If you ever chat GPT breaks on, you're gonna see a Ray ID as the on the bottom. So for their billion a year worth of inference revenue, that's what OpenAI is gonna be saying. Um, but Ray data as a package actually understands how to go retrieve binary, retrieve text, retrieve parquet. And so between those things, we can say things like go retrieve parquet, but also um, go get data from um, say Looker or you know, some of those other data sources. And so it really, it, those things come from those integrations and those libraries. What we're doing to kind of make that unique is to merge these things into kind of a more usable pipeline, right? So that people can retrieve them without all the rigmarole. What we found actually is that the people who are doing data engineering, and I mean, this comes from our you know, work at Faction doing multi-cloud data, I think this experience is retrieving the data is not the hard part. The hard part is like, where is it? Where does it live? How do I get it? Where are the credentials? It's all that metadata. And some of the classic tools like the Hive Metastore that we mentioned, they don't even carry all the data for that. Like Hive Metastore, notably, you can declare an external table and it tells you where to get it from a bucket perspective, but it doesn't tell you the endpoint. It doesn't tell you what the credentials are. Now, this was something where, this is the dirty secret of like data in the cloud. If you do everything in Amazon or everything in Azure, you don't have a problem because you're just going to assign instance roles to the instances that'll get access to the data in the buckets. But the moment you break that paradigm, just like your life becomes a little bit of like a credential management nightmare. So um, let's see. Let's jump into, um, where were we down here? Yeah, oh, and th th this is actually a good example right here. So this is the stuff we just ingested. And if I hit this now, now this is actually, this would work at much larger scale, right? And I'm gonna walk you through what's happening here because it's kind of cool. What you see here, when we see this, we're declaring um, Kamiwaza's retrieval service. So the retrieval service is something that manages going and looking up the data from the catalog, um, creating all the things we call runners, which are basically data retrievers that can go out there and connect it to disparate data sources. And it doesn't even have to be one. Like you can actually declare a data source that's a mix of say file data and object data or object data that lives in more than one place. But then when we create that totally lazy load at that point, like nothing happens when you declare the retriever. But when I start iterating on, this is like living on top of Ray data, this is how it operates. As soon as we start iterating the data set, workers turn up and it starts going out to fetch those data. In this case, this is all the parquet that we just ingested. And you can see we're just kind of printing the schema of these things, which is just some sample data. But it gives you like a, a kind of good feel for, um, if you've ever done data science work, you understand that a lot of times this is literally like 50 lines of code, right? So we're, we're gonna take it down. And although uh, we don't wanna do it now, cause honestly it, it's a little time consuming too with the stuff that we've turned up here in the size of the data set, I'll show you this piece of code. So you understand too that you can actually take a data set and this is what I was referring to earlier. We say map it into our sentence transformer embeddings. We're saying take all these data sets, break them into chunks, send them in to be embedded then take all those badges from that and send them right into the vector database, which is the Melvis implementation. And when you're done, get the results from all of those. But um, because Intel was so kind to invite us and, and uh, along with um, the good folks here, we wanted to actually show some cool inference. And we actually, one of the things we do is worry a lot about what models can you run and where can you run them? And, and incidentally, we see a lot of funny things too about, um, People's like weird misconceptions. Like people ask, like, how big of a you know, how big of a CPU farm or GPU do I need to run Model X or things like that? And the reality is, there's a strange amount of flexibility here. Like if you have a really big graphics card or a lot of CPUs, one system can be running many models simultaneously. Um, 
The flip side can, the inverse can also be true though. So we, we talked to a, a customer recently, they have 4,500 developers. One of their first big applications that they're starting to roll out is they actually built a chatbot that can um, you know, provide completely internal code, like data never leaks out of the enterprise. So they're using some of the top you know, open source code generation models out there. Um, they're doing a lot of things to kind of plug it into other workflows they have inside of that enterprise. But they're looking at this idea of how many GPUs are we going to need and how are we going to scale up and down. And this is a weird, interesting, classic problem. And I know people like Keith, you've got like this lot of experience in the VMware world, right? You understand over committing things, right? And being able to shift resources is a critical part of managing infrastructure. And so one of the reasons we built on Ray is that the framework that we're, we've developed here allows us to take a single copy of a model. And as we see pressure on the API, because more and more requests are coming in, we can actually give you a bounds and scale up more copies of that model. And if it goes idle, we'll scale them back down, including if you set the setting to it all the way to zero, we'll just undeploy the model. And if you hit that API endpoint, we can actually catch the request and go, oh, somebody wants that model, and go and deploy it again. And it'll, the API request will just sit there getting a keep alive while the model loads, right? Which for a lot of the people are using small models for certain use cases. So it'll only take a second or two to be loaded and then active, and then it can fade away. And that pattern, you guys will recognize from kind of time immemorial and IT concerns, but this is the kind of thing that I think all the SaaS you know, services have mastered, but the enterprises, not at all, right? So, um, well, now this is a pure CPU-based inferencing here, and I just kind of declared our prompts. There's some, there's some, <laughs> there's some fun, like, uh, look at how this LLM works stuff baked into these prompts. It's pretty hilarious. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to run them. Now, this is just a warning saying, oh, you're not connecting over OpenSSL because it's connecting to a local node. We're actually using the OpenAP, OpenAI SDK, though. right? I'm actually running OpenAI chat completions. It's not really OpenAI, of course. It's going into a model that's running inside of our engine deployed on top of Llama CPP doing pure CPU inference. I was impressed. So I actually am you know, dovetailing on the kind of theme here. This is actually running on those fifth gen Xeons, and they're pretty, pretty quick. Um, you'll see at the bottom I collect some statistics and we're getting 33 tokens a second. So that's pretty solid um, on this system. And you see, um, you know, this is the PHI, you know, textbooks are all you need. This is PHI 2, which is an improvement, right? And it's funny because you'll get completely different things from these. Like actually, I will tell you this, this thing, and we could run it again right now, has actually answered this print prime numbers, which is my favorite. Like, let's just see if this thing is working. It's answered it correctly probably nine times out of 10. And this is a weird thing. We were talking earlier about why would you distribute inference? And, and we talk a lot about how enterprises don't understand the complexity of inference. And this is a good example. If somebody asks a simple question every once in a while, you know, these models, these LLMs and other kind of neural network models, they are non-deterministic, which is what makes them so great in some ways and also so terrible because you will not get the same answer every time. And so a whole part of your strategy for using them in production has to be, how do I make sure that I put guardrails around these so that I don't get nonsense that goes to the user? It's not bad that the model does it once in a while because you can catch it, but this is where you do multiple passes to say, give me an answer. Then you go back to a model, it could be the same model, it could be a different model, and you say, does this answer make sense? Because it rarely makes the same mistake twice on a good model, and it becomes really important. So you can see um, all of our kind of things here. I thought it was really funny too how um, it has a really hard time um, classifying things. I hated to run out of cookies. What is it? Is it positive or negative about our cookies? It's negative. No, it's not. Hating to run out means that they love the cookies. I actually thought this was because it was PHI, and I actually pasted this exact same prompt into GPT-4, and it gave me the exact same answer, and I was kind of blown away that it was that dumb about it. So, I, you know, this is why there's a, there's a lot of engineering that goes into solutions like this, right? There's no freebies, um, although it's incredibly powerful. And, so. and Matt, what was the speed you were seeing on those? running? It's on right at the bottom there. 33 yep. tokens a second across all those kind of sample requests we just saw. Yeah, which is pretty great. I mean, you know, that's quite performant. In, it's running on opinion. your laptop? That no, this is a running on an Azure instance. Yeah, this one. Xeon, all that stuff. Right? Just, yeah. just Intel. There's no graphics cards. The, the SV5, six, I think 64 core, maybe something. I don't, I don't think we're actually using all the cores though for this, because we're we're only running five in parallel. It's interesting too when you run these things regardless of the environment. Like, we see environments where a sort of this is something again from a best practice perspective we do a lot of. Right, a naive inference against the card you might see. 
even against an A100, for example, I've tested the FIND, PHIND code generation models. Fantastic. Gotten, say, 40 to 50 tokens a second. But if you switch to like the properly tuned engine that has continuous batching, page retention, kind of all these bells and whistles, 600 tokens a second, right? So it's a you know 12 to 15x increase to quote unquote do it right. So. Matt, have you ever had to work with customers that have images or complex things that are in their documents? So this is a question I asked earlier. About yeah. Like uh, you know. Some documentation has complex table structures. Yeah. Uh, some have images that are reference diagrams. Um, I'm sure that some of them are doing it. I haven't had a lot of those conversations yet, but have you seen the doc LLM paper? Uh, maybe. Okay. So it, it was actually a team inside of, I want to say, Salesforce's AI team came out, came out with this. I think it was Salesforce. But yeah, Google for um, doc LLM, DOC LLM. It's, it's actually, yeah, I stopped sharing. Is that a problem? I'm sorry. <laughs> I like don't want to stare at my Jupyter notebook anymore. Um, they actually did a really cool thing where where language models, you know, they use this self attention mechanism, right? Where they pay attention to groups of words basically at the same time. It helps them make sense of large bodies of data at scale. They actually applied one attention mechanism to the text of the document and a separate attention mechanism to its position on the page. Like they encoded the x y values of those things. Then they did what is called a cross attention layer to link those. And so it becomes very knowledgeable. And so those weird PDFs where you see like some of them are the label on the left and the, the answer on the right, yeah. or they're the label on top but the text below, it really understands that. It's a great, it's a really interesting paper. I, I would bet money that we see this implemented in an open source model within the next couple of months. They, were, they didn't release the model, but they were very, very frank about how they did it in the paper. Cool. Yeah. Um, kind of a more general question, um, you know, all the, the executives you were saying y'all talked to earlier, could you tell me more about who those were, how many there were? It's about 35 C-level execs, all Fortune 500. C-level IT, line of business? Uh, CIO, CTO at the core level, and that seems to be in generative AI. Um, that phase one, where people are playing in that SaaS sandbox, that's happening at the line of business level. Mm -hmm. And then once it actually becomes institutionalized, needs to touch real data, needs to actually be a driving force to make decisions, it typically bubbles right to the core. Right. And what out of those conversations, what parts of that stuff surprise you and what stuff seemed pretty obvious? Uh, it's amazing. Like one thing that actually I, we didn't bring up earlier is the RAG process we've all been talking about. <laughs> uh, the enterprise storage vendors are lagging a little behind the cloud vendors in the standpoint of once you've ran that embedding model and you've actually put that model uh, in your vector database, what happens when that data underlying changes on your file or your object system? Nothing's notifying an LLM to re-update or reprocess that. In the cloud, you can work whole pipelines and services to get notifications. So that was a big surprise for us where there were some more advanced services possibly running in the ecosystem in the cloud versus on-prem. But guess what? Most of their data was on-prem and that's where they were trying to fix it. But the idea of like changes triggering something like a serverless function, like that's a super classic, predates, you know, Gen AI by a million years. Like you put an object with metadata into S3, you can click kick off an event that ends up going into a Lambda function to index the metadata, put it in DynamoDB, because none of that's built into the hood. But you can take that exact same pattern, obviously, and then switch it to generating and embedding, right? But we, we expect to see a lot more of that. In fact, like one of the reasons, one of the things we have integrated in our catalog layer is a Kafka bus, so you can actually take events so that we can get notifications that data has changed and like update indicators about like data freshness and stuff in the catalog. Like what was what were they trying to do today, and what was so bad about it that they were looking for alternatives? I think the biggest problem really is not that they dislike what they're doing. I mean, I think the more people dig in and if they have a little bit of patience, they're getting great results. Like we talked to somebody just yesterday who was starting to really implement um, chat with their internal documentation as well as code generation for their developers at scale. They're adamant about not data not leaving the four walls. But the more they've dug into it, the better the results they're getting. But the problem is, like, there is not um, a great set of tools when you start thinking about thousands of developers, not a great set of tools for deploying this. It, it was even worse. Thing. There was a stack running in Azure, a totally separate stack to actually plug into the AWS one, and a totally separate stack to run it on-prem. And it was all sort of dictated on where the data was, which apps they could use, which developers they had to break out of their development pool and they couldn't cross work them, et cetera. So the ability to have one stack across everything, one user experience was a massive parallel change for them. Yeah, the thing that really excites me about what we're doing is that the more we've got to have conversations with customers who are like getting 
basically the more sophisticated they are, the, the further they are along on the journey, the more this resonates because we're hitting those like, it's not day one, it's not the tire kicking. We come in at day two and it's that phase two to three to four journey where I think we're, we're really kind of helping them take those steps.